We negate contention one is an arms cascade. East Asia has reached a plateau of stability. Regional nations feel confident in their security. Specifically, the ideal 08 explains that Article 9 has prevented the development of an arms race and nuclear proliferation throughout East Asia. However, the revision of Japan's Article 9 would cause an arms race in two ways. First is frightening allies. Wadsworth 19 writes that a Japanese revision of Article 9 and thus offensive capability could decrease regional confidence in the credibility of the U.S. The move would be interpreted by those under the U.S. umbrella as a sign that Tokyo is losing confidence in the United States' credibility to protect them. Wadsworth furthers this could cause a chain reaction that causes more U.S. allies to develop their own capabilities, creating instability in Asia. GO08 concludes that regional stability in Asia can be correlated to the degree of collective confidence about America's capabilities to defend the region. Second is scaring adversaries. Indeed, Hudson 21 reports that Japan's history with both China and Korea continues to be a defining event for generations, which is why both countries have objected to any form of Japanese rearmament. Thus, Stebbing 17 finds countries like China and North Korea, who view a Japanese remilitarization as a threat, would attempt to maximize their security by expanding their own capabilities, triggering a localized arms race. An arms buildup across Asia would be detrimental. Gibbler 05 explains that arms races create instability in the capability ratio between rivals, forming disputes when one rival fears the overtaking of another, which is why Wallace 79 finds disputes preceded by an arms race escalated to conflict 23 out of 28 times. Reviewing empirics, Frank 20 quantifies that a conflict in the Asia Pacific could lead to 25 million deaths. Contingent to is the rebirth of Japanese imperialism. Despite desires to intervene in the war on terror and the Persian Gulf Wars of the 1990s, Japan has been forced to remain pacifistic since the birth of its constitution. Article 9 has effectively kept Japan out of global conflicts, dictating that the use of force abroad is not permitted. Revision would change this permanently. Ready 19 explains that revising Article 9 will mean Japan's militarization will become more commonplace in a world where it can engage in foreign conflicts without being under attack itself. Without Article 9, Japan would become emboldened abroad for two reasons. First is war hawks. Hudson 21 writes that the Japanese far right, including current Prime Minister Kishida, has established a political presence in Japan over the last decade, causing a swell of nationalist sentiment and demand for remilitarization. Dixon 10 furthers that the far right in Japan has sought to expand their military role in the international arena, including increasing interventions on behalf of counterterrorism. However, Article 9 has empirically prevented these efforts. Although former right-wing Prime Minister Koizumi tried to push for foreign intervention, Midford 06 finds that Article 9 prevented all movement beyond humanitarian aid. Second is the military-industrial complex. Collusion between the Japanese government and contractors have been intensifying. Hughes 10 finds that retired bureaucrats and officers are consistently placed on the board of companies, and the creation of the LDP's defense tribe consists of policymakers seeking to broader policy on weapons acquisition. Cox 14 writes that the military-industrial complex shapes and defines foreign policy, pushing for intervention into foreign conflicts to maximize profits. Japanese intervention abroad would be detrimental. Japanese intervention would likely be in the Middle East. Lamont 19 explains there are clear strategic motives since Japan is dependent on it for energy, importing close to 90% of its crude oil from the region. As an additional actor who either has to be defeated militarily or consent to agreements, Bader 18 finds that non-humanitarian foreign interventions have a divisive effect that worsens civil conflict. Generally, PSD 16 quantifies that foreign military interventions reduce physical quality of life based on life expectancy to 20% of what it was before the intervention. More specifically, Ahmed 16 clarifies that total deaths from Western interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan alone likely constitute around 4 million people. For those reasons, we are very proud to be here. All right, cool. Um, is everyone ready? It's again, mission on the AF, and I'm the first speaker, Rahul Pasha. All right, cool. If everyone's ready, then I'll begin. Zed and I affirm, contention one is the dragon warrior. Just as Putin could not tolerate Ukrainian independence, Schumann 22 finds that China will never accept an independent Taiwan, which they consider as being occupied by an illegitimate government. Even worse, Schumann explains that the Ukraine crisis has shown that the US won't fight for others, leading Frank 22 to confirm that China has plans to invade Taiwan as soon as next fall. Because the US is not a credible deterrent, Murano 21 finds that strengthening Japanese capabilities is the best way to deter China. 
Unfortunately, Article 9 currently prevents Japanese military preparedness for defensive and deterrence purposes. Preventing a Taiwanese invasion is key, as Fish 17 quantifies that such a war could lead to the deaths of millions of people. Even worse, Lauda 13 finds that Taiwan is the single most likely crisis that would trigger a nuclear war between China and the U.S. by miscalculation. This is because the legitimacy of both the Communist Party and the U.S. defense commitments depends on Taiwan. Contention 2 is a toy story. Akimoto 13 writes that Japan's space policy has been restricted by Article 9, and Japan was forbidden to develop satellites. This pulled the linchpin of missile defense, as, as Marquinhos 07 explains that early warning satellites capable of detecting an incoming missile are forbidden due to the military nature of such advanced systems. Revising the constitution is key, as Fadden 20 explains that Article 9 prevented the self-defense forces from creating information gathering satellites, a prerequisite to missile defense systems. The impact is nuclear defense. Herald 17 confirms that Japanese participation in the missile defense network is extremely important because the current network does not cover Western Pacific and Asian regions like North Korea and China. This is critical because Borger 18 finds that the broadening of nuclear contemplation and a lack of communication between nuclear powers make the chance of nuclear use the highest it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Contention 3 is the Lion King. Pfeffer 19 of the IPS writes, the United States is losing its status as a Pacific power. Instead, China has become a dominant economic and military player in East Asia. Koga 17 writes, and if the status quo continues, China will be able to exert more influence, shift the regional balance of power, and reformulate the U.S.-led system. Luckily, Blan 20 explains that Japan looks well-placed to counterbalance China, as Southeast Asian elites see Japan as the region's most trusted ex external partner. However, Article 9 is necessary for countering China in two ways. Subpoint A is regional resistance. INS21 reports that China is challenging its neighbors' energy activities within their own sovereignty. China's disputes over land and sea territory with most of its neighbors on a regular basis. Unfortunately, Citrus 18 finds that no single member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has the military strength to challenge China. With an Article 9 revision, the organization can now leverage Japanese power to challenge China directly. Military power allows the credible enforcement of such international law. And regional diplomacy is key, as Valesco 13 finds that regional organizations are six times more likely to craft an agreement that is not broken for at least five years. Subpoint B is a better alternative. Already, Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia are decreasing Japanese influence. Nikki 22 finds that Malaysia will become more reliant on, China, on Chinese trade and investments. Luckily, Lee 14 notes that Japan's militarization enables the creation of a new alliance system. Weaker Asian countries will oppose China if a dwindling U.S. has support from a stronger Japan anchoring multilateral alliances. Smith 21 confirms that for states to entertain balancing, there must be countries powerful enough to resist the rising power and provide security alternatives. The impact is a Game of Thrones. Solvin 20 explains that China will try to establish regional hegemony in the Pacific and push U.S. forces farther and farther away from China's shores. He furthers that China is gearing up to contest America's global leadership. Allison 15 finds that a war between China and the United States is more likely than not. When a rising power like China is threatening a ruling power like the United States, crises that otherwise would be contained can initiate a cascade of reactions that escalate. Devastatingly, Thompson 21 finds that any war, China may resort to nuclear use because they have no way of determining whether an attack is nuclear or conventional. Beijing may launch its nukes before they're potentially destroyed. A nuclear conflict would be devastating as the APA 13 finds that war involving less than 0.5% of the world's nuclear weapons would still put 2 billion lives at risk. Thus, we affirm. Can I see, I think, one piece of evidence? Yeah, for sure. Can I just see whatever evidence you have that, like, an invasion of Taiwan is likely? Yeah, Wait, sure. Yeah, on top of that, can I we also something, right? sorry, on top of that, can we also see that um in like China's planning to invade next fall? Oh yeah, that's sure. I'll get both of those. Um is that I already put it in. Okay. Okay, that's been sent. Okay, I'll let you know when I get it and then Carson, you want to unmute for mm -hmm. let me turn the volume up on Uh, Viv just got it, so are we cool for cross? Yeah. Okay, starting time now. Can I take the first question? Of course. Uh, let's talk about being the, actually, let's talk about the idea of like a shifting, or let's talk about the better, better alternative idea under your contention three, right? You say that countries right now, like Malaysia are becoming increasingly dependent on China, right? Yep. 
So if they have like dependencies on China, like you say, Malaysia for energy or other resources, how does a military increase in Japan change this dependency whatsoever? Aren't they still forced in the end to fall on the side of Chinese hegemony if they're so dependent? So it's not about resources. It's more about trade and investment. Malaysia already has tons of their own resources that through domestic industries they can extract and then use. The thing is that right now these countries are shifting towards China and they're fearful of Chinese of challenging China's hegemony or rising growth, right? When Japan offers an alternative, a new security alliance, then they're more likely to accept Japan because they're more trusted generally than like China. But but you just said that there's this dependency on trade with China, right? So if they're always yeah, going yeah. to be dependent on trade, how does a shift to a Japanese market change that? Right now, their economies are so intertwined, right? Malaysia is so dependent on the imports from China and so dependent on exporting from China. A revision of Article 9 doesn't change this, right? It's not like they can change their dependency overnight. Again. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. But countries can always change their dependency. For example, countries in Europe right now are changing their like energy dependency on Russia and moving away. But also, apart from the economics of the situation, they are also able to gain control of like Japan's security once they re re revise Article Nine and then get all the benefits of added security, which is most of our, which is what most of our arguments about. Can I ask a question? Sure. All right. So. Let's talk about your first argument about adversaries, right? You say that China and Korea are going to be opposed to Japan militarizing. So specifically on South Korea. Um, it's North Korea. Not oh, South North Korea. Korea. All right. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. Um, in that case, we'll respond to it in rebuttal. Can I ask a question on your second argument, though? Yeah. All right. So you say in your first part that all of these far right politicians in Japan are gonna start pushing for more foreign interventions. So- They are already pushing for foreign interventions. Okay, so like where have they done this so far? So they've pushed for this in the Persian Gulf War in the 1990s. They pushed for this in the war in Iraq in 2003. They pushed for this in Afghanistan in the Middle East multiple times in the past. Okay, so then does not that make this non-unique? Like if they haven't no, revised the article nine and they're already doing these interventions. The, okay, the thing, this is really crucial because the war hawks within Japan really want to intervene in the Middle East, and they've pushed to intervene multiple times, but they have not been able to because the single thing that is stopping them from actually being able to go in is Article 9. Okay, but you just said they intervened in the first Gulf War. No, no, I said they wanted to intervene. They pushed oh, okay. for intervention, but it never happened because of Article 9. That's cross. Okay, Carson. All right, cool. Uh, the order is just going to be down their case. Is anyone not ready? You good, Carson? Mm -hmm. All right. Then my time will start now. Let's start on time. Oh, sorry. My timer didn't go off. <laughs> sorry. Time starts now. Let's start on their contention one about Taiwan. They say that the Ukraine crisis has shown that the U.S. won't fight for others, but that's unique to that crisis as Ukraine is not a part of NATO, which means they have no commitment, but the U.S. has a commitment to Taiwan. But even so, you can turn their argument, as Rodriguez 21 explains, under militarization, the development of long-range capabilities signals that Japan could strike China, which would force them to preempt an attack, leading to the devastating escalation scenario that would kill millions. This outweighs for two reasons. First, on probability, China and its population remembers the atrocities of an imperial Japan, such as the Nanjing massacre, and aggression from Japan creates unique domestic support for a response. But second, it short circuits their argument, and ISDP 18 explains that all Japanese constitutional amendments take one year to go into effect after being passed. This means that retaliation happens before any deterrence materializes, because China knows this one-year time frame is the best period to do anything, and open win closing windows of opportunity make aggressors more desperate and more likely to attack. Let's go to their impact. First, their evidence is really bad. Their Frank 22 evidence that gives time frame for conflict cites a literal Twitter post, but then China won't invade Taiwan for four reasons. First, Keck explains that integrating Taiwan would create resistance, which Xi can't afford because of COVID and the party election. Second, Beckley finds that Taiwan will have more troops than China in the invasion because only 10% of its coastline is suitable for landing. Third, Elliot 19 finds that weather on the Taiwan Strait is too violent for assault ships to land. And fourth, Nanrang 22 finds that China 
China needs Taiwan for its tech industry because it provides 92% of global semiconductors. Let's go to their second contention about a toy story. First, space capabilities provoke China. Hayes 22 details that there's not a space race underway right now, but if Japan undertook responses, it would make China feel threatened and precipitate one. That's why Finch 15 writes that in space attacking enemy satellites is easier than actually defending your own, which is why Mitchell finds that it would make a war comparative to a nuclear war. Space escalation prereqs their entire argument as Japan Japan will never be able to gather intel because A, China gets angry and preemptively strikes the satellites, or B, China jams them, which gets me to my second response, which is why Foster 22 writes that China has satellite jamming capabilities that block their ability to have radar imaging and communications. But then you can delink their argument again as ISDP 20 finds that a modification to Japanese space policy, the basic space law, no longer limits the development of satellites to non-military purposes and actually allows them to use already built satellites for defense. That's really crucial. They say that Japan can't develop satellites, but this is not true as Kotani 21 writes that Japan already has seven working satellites and is planning on building 10 more. But even if you don't buy that Japan can use their own satellites, Tenderman 20 writes that the U.S. has four satellites that, pro that provide coverage of the Asia Pacific and are literally in an intelligence alliance with Japan. Let's go to their third argument about Chinese hegemony. At the top, Fully Love explains that China is actually weakening right now from structural issues such as an aging population, and they'll decline 50% in population, increase debt, and have an inward-looking political system. They aren't rising. But let's look at their specific links. First on Asian, Asian literally isn't a military alliance that has zero military power, which means Article 9 does nothing. But then second, you can non-unique the argument as Asian countries such as South Korea and Australia are already attempting to strengthen the organization through unifying interests and economic leverage. But third, you can turn their argument, as Brookings 21 explains, that Asian has established ties with both the U.S. and China and has the potential to serve as a neutral third party, but Japanese spearheading Asian against China would turn the alliance into a direct enemy. Let's go to their subpoint B about being the other option. One, Ch China's allies won't just shift to Japan. Democracies will always favor the West, and, J and Japan, while authoritarian dictatorships, will always align with China. These ideologic ideologies are so polar there won't be flip-flopping but then you can turn their argument as Japanese offensive development would push countries away from Japan as they would be seen as more committed to aggression than diplomacy that's because Ho 17 explains that most consider constitution revision a march back to Japanese oppressive military past that's why empirically after A's revisions you saw protests across East Asia um so you mind if I see two pieces of evidence before we take our preparation time? So uh, first, can I see the first piece of evidence that you read in response to my third contention that says China's weakening? And then the second piece of evidence would be the uh, last response that you read from Ho. Oh, got it. Uh, and then we'll start prep time when that comes through. Okay, got one, gonna do the other, it's the whole evidence. Ah, my computer just froze, give me a second. Okay, got it, it's back. That froze again. No problem. Okay, it keeps like freezing and unfreezing. No, it like actually keeps freezing and unfreezing.
not entering. Can you find it? Yeah. I My computer's completely oh, frozen. Uh, you have it, Ho? Yeah, I have Ho. Okay, so I'm gonna send the first one. This first one's sent, you send the second. Okay. Okay, uh, replying. Okay. It's sent. Uh, I just see one piece of evidence in there. It's two different it's emails because he sent one, I sent one. Oh, okay. I'll wait for the second one. Uh, I think we got the second one. Too. Okay. All right. Our preparation time will start now then. All right, so I am the second speaker for Mission on the Con, and in this speech, I will have the privilege of addressing some of the allegations that were made against my case in the last speech, and then responding to my opponent's case. Is anyone not ready? All right, excited. Let's begin. Time starts now. Let's start off on my first contention. If my res opponent's responses are true, and there are so many structural reasons why China would not want to invade Taiwan, like having so many semiconductor trades, in addition to the fact that China is an aging population, that also means that China would never launch a retaliatory invasion. Moreover, they give you the response that says that it would take a year for Article 9 to go into effect. Well, if that's the case, China is a rational actor. They're never going to start a war if they know that they're going to lose in a year, which means that these responses take each other out. On my second contention, they claim that China has, Ch China has satellite jamming capabilities. Well, if this response is true, then it's also true that China would never launch a space war because they can just use satellite jamming. They don't need to spend so much money to escalate in the region. This means you don't vote on any of these arguments. But the place you can vote is on our third contention about the Lion King. More specifically, they tell you that China is weakening right now. But all of the reasons they list about why China is weakening are economic incentives. What they fail to realize is that China is becoming the most dominant military hegemon in the region, which is why our green evidence, which comes a year later than their evidence, tells you that right now China is the global hegemon. And by 2050, they would have eclipsed and become the global hegemon if we stick on the status quo, which is why we need to revise Article 9 so that Japan can project US alliance strength in the region in order to make sure that these countries don't turn to China in order to stop a hegemonic transition. On my first argument about ASEAN, they claim that ASEAN is not a military alliance. Well, if that's the case, then China perceives it as not a military alliance, which means that it's never going to, like, which means Verbizon is never going to destroy ASEAN as an alliance, which takes out the rest of their responses. Vote on the last argument here about a better alternative. Both of the responses are not persuasive. First, they claim that democracies always shift towards the West. While this might be true in theory, our evidence says that democracies right now are turning towards China. Specifically, our evidence isolates Malaysia and other countries in the region, which are currently turning towards China because the US does not have a credible alliance system in the region. Their last response is over time, but it's also not persuasive. They claim that other countries in the region are don't like Article 9 revision. 
but prefer our Hayes evidence, which comes two years after theirs, which indicates that countries like South Korea actually do like revision insofar as they understand that North Korea and China are existential threats. At that point, we can move to their arguments and respond. On their first contention, remember that East Asia isn't peaceful right now. The green evidence indicates that right now you see China expanding faster than ever in addition to a North Korea state, which is most aggressive. This takes out their second link insofar as you and I both know that if these allies enemies are proliferating right now, there's not much more proliferation that they can do. More specifically, they claim that revising Article 9 is going to frighten allies. But their evidence comes from Wadsworth, which is just a blanket study which is looking at what could potentially happen in the region. It doesn't isolate any specific countries or explain why they would perceive an action as such. Instead, prefer our Krebs analysis, which has a historical indication of every single time the United States has pulled in and out of regions, in addition to allied proliferation. And it finds that if Japan revised Article 9, countries would perceive that there's more funding from the United States available to be redistributed across the entire alliance system, which is why they'd fear more safe, and which is why they never proliferate. Moreover, this argument doesn't really have an impact because they never explain why proliferation would lead to a war. Instead, I'd argue that countries would develop weapons, but it would never lead to a conflict because the more weapons you have, the higher the perceived cost of your actions. And this makes sense because we've seen countries like India, Pakistan, Israel develop nuclear weapons and even more conventional capabilities, but it's never spiraled into a war. Let's talk about their second contention about a rebirth in terror. This argument is a little bit silly. Remember, it doesn't make much sense why Japan would want to engage in foreign interventions. After all, they have basically the same foreign policy as the United States, and the US does everything that they do. In fact, I think it makes more strategic sense for them not to engage engage in foreign policy in other countries, especially considering the fact that the United States spends the money for them and basically does everything that they want to do. Their first argument is that war hawks are galvanizing the population to be able to intervene. But they cited a prime minister who's been out of office since 2001. He has tried to push seven different prime minister candidates in order to intervene into other countries, but that's never worked. Even if you revise Article 9, I'd advocate that there's no public will inside of Japan in order to intervene in other countries. They have no foreign policy in regions like the Middle East and never would. Moreover, I'd argue that right now Japan is has a strategic middle ground in, in the Middle East, specifically because they can use diplomacy in order to come to a negotiating table with countries like Israel and Iran. That's very important because when you revise Article 9, it opens up a plethora of other policy options that they can use to formulate diplomacy in the Middle East, which is why all of their evidence is about US interventions in the Middle East, not Japanese interventions. For those reasons, I'm incredibly proud to negate. Thank you for, or affirm, thank you for your time. All right, do you want to take cross before, I mean, prep before cross? Yeah, prep before cross. Oh yeah, I'll let you finish flowing. Okay. Oh yeah, cool. We're going to take prep starting. All right, cool. Go to, go to. All right, that was 142. Are you ready for crossfire? Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay if I get the first question? Absolutely. Okay. So you talk about how South Korea actually likes revision, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about the rest of like East Asian countries, especially the ones that you already outlined that Japan needs to like strengthen their alliance with? Because I'd say like Japan and South Korea already are pretty much on the same page. 
I mean, I disagree with that. I think, well, first of all, your Ho evidence, which you sent me, says that in the past, South Korea has disliked Japanese proliferation, which means that they obviously have not been on the same page. But our evidence says that in recent years, they've become on the same page, which is very important. Wait, 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 wait. you just said two things that completely contradict no, each other. I, you I, said... Can you mind if I clarify? And then, yeah. So what I'm saying is, while in the past, they might not have been on the same page, now, because of rising powers like North Korea and China, they are on the same page, understanding that there are existential threats in the region yeah. and Japanese militarization is the best option for countering exactly. them. Exactly. That answer... gets back to my initial question. Yeah. So which... answer your question now. Um, other countries in the region, I'd argue, probably have the same threat calculus, also considering the fact that Japan and South Korea are two of the largest East, East Asian countries in terms of like support from the United States and military. If they see them supporting this operation, they're probably going to have the same perception. But if China and North Korea are still existential threats for those other countries, they're probably going to act in the same way, wanting to push that back. Do you mind if I get a question? Sure, and then I'll ask a follow-up after. Sure. So let's talk about your second contention on the rebirth and terror. So if mm -hmm. Japan revises Article 9, um, Exactly how many troops like would they be sending to the Middle Eastern operations or like would they be starting crises, I guess is my question. Yeah, so we tell you that foreign intervention normally sparks civil war. If A, it sparks civil war. B, if there's already civil war that exists, it prolongs it. That's our Cox evidence. And so what we're saying is that a, you have the incentive structure, you have war hawks, you have the military industrial complex who all want to intervene abroad. B, you have historical examples of Japanese war hawks wanting to intervene but can't because of Article 9. And C, you have impact evidence that's really clear saying that foreign intervention is really bad. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, what civil wars would Japan intervene in and why? Yeah, so intervention in civil war, there's actually evidence out there that they'd like intervene in Oh, what was the, it's a North African country. I forget which one, it's not Sudan. I could get that, uh, Algeria. They want to intervene in Algeria, but like that's a civil war there. But even if you're, we're talking about the Middle East specifically, what do they there's have to still so that? much conflict in the Middle East. We're saying that not only can they prolong civil wars if they exist because civil wars constantly arise in the Middle East. But Other countries help. probably like also engage in those civil wars, right? Like the United, like if there's a coalition of 70 countries that is engaging in a civil war in the Middle East and Japan engages by sending 50 troops, do you think that that's really going to have an aggregate effect on the trend of the civil war? I mean, I'd say it's pretty scalar at the point where Japan has a large military and like is a big power so that's pretty big mm -hmm. and intervention is really bad you see it's like every major power who joins a proxy war it becomes significantly worse but that's time that's cross do you need wrap? Uh, wait actually i want to tell you one thing okay Right. Yeah, right that on. was 11 seconds. So it's going to be uh, my case weighing and then my party's case. Uh, ba -ba -ba, let me pull up my part of the doc. Okay. Is anyone not ready? Starting time now. At the top of my uh, at the top of our case, my opponents try to push the idea right now that East Asia is not peaceful. But fundamentally, we have to realize that East Asia is not on the brink of war. They're at a steady peace right now. Remember, my opponent's evidence that gives you the time frame and talks about how war is imminent is literally from a Twitter post. Right now, we're not seeing any conflict or war. There is steady peace in Japan. Let's keep it the way it is. Look to our second argument about Japanese imperialism, the cleanest place to, place to vote in the round. We tell you that despite past attempts to intervene in foreign conflicts like the Gulf War, Japan's Article 9 has barred them from doing so. But after revision, Japan would intervene abroad because of war hawks. The Japanese government is ridden with right-wing nationalist hawks that are eager for conflict and push for interventions abroad. But secondly, the military industrial complex has already infiltrated the Japanese government and wants to maximize profits. This is detrimental because Japan is very energy dependent on the Middle East, meaning intervention would likely manifest there, causing instability, exacerbating civil conflicts, which our evidence says have already killed 4 million people directly because of Western interventions. My opponents say a couple of responses. First, they say that Japan basically has the same foreign policy as the US, and this means they would never intervene. This literally concedes our link. If Japan is the same foreign policy as the US, the US has been intervening in conflicts for decades in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I could keep going on. This just supercharges our link. 
Second, they say that we cite a prime minister that has been out of office office since like 2021. This is not true. We cite the current prime minister, Kashida, as well as the past two prime ministers that are currently right wing war hawks. Third, they try to turn us by saying that like Article 9 revision strengthens diplomacy, but one, there's no diplomacy right now. There is a lot of conflict in the Middle East. And second, if you have intervention and the revision of Article 9, like the countries in the Middle East perceive that there's more imperialism, they like on net pull out of diplomacy deals. But let's go to the wing that's very clear for us. If Japan is emboldened abroad and intervenes, this short circuits any countries that would turn to Japan because Japan is now perceived as an aggressive and interventionist actor taking away from its credibility. Countries don't want to associate themselves with Japan if Japan looks like they're returning to their imperial past. But let's go on to my opponent's case. Right off the bat, they make a fatal mistake that immediately costs them the round. They concede the non-unique that other countries like South Korea and Australia are using economic leverage to increase the power of Asia and keeping stability within uh, Asia. This means that they literally have zero offense. If that is true, it means that Asia is already becoming strong, and that means that Chinese hegemony is already being countered. They have zero unique offense. But second, they mishandle a piece of defense that also costs them the round. We tell you that the ideologies of China and the U.S. are so polar, and democracies will always turn towards the U.S. They give you the example of Malaysia. Malaysia is literally becoming authoritarian. That's why they're turning to China. And this is also just one example. It is a very clean neg ballot. All right, cool. Um, before my summary speech, we'll take some prep time starting now. All right, we have 10 seconds left of prep. Um, this is again, the affirmative summary speech from Mission. Uh, in this speech, I'll start off by explaining our third argument, sort of defending it, and then go on to weighing and comparing all the arguments in the round and then refuting our opponents. Everyone ready? All right, again, starting on our third arguments. All right. You're gonna be voting on our third argument about the Lion King. What we tell you is that the US military power in the Pacific is deteriorating at the moment. That's the green evidence is from 2022. It's been uncontested the entire round. If we continue on the current trajectory, China's expansionism will be able to provoke and escalate conflicts that potentially go nuclear and threaten over 2 billion lives. The only way of stopping this is through mul anchoring multilateral alliances through Japan's revision of Article 9. This allows Japan to replace China's reliance and provide security, military security to countries in the Asia Pacific region like the Southeast Asian countries and South Korea. In response, they tell you, they give you two responses. They first tell you that South Korea and Australia are strengthening ASEAN. Again, we're not going for this argument of the Southeast Asian organization. What we are telling you is that the ASEAN alliance, as per our opponent's own uh, response, is not a military alliance, which means the only way to actually stop Chinese military expansionism is through our second point about a better alternative. And by Japan literally revising Article 9 and creating a better, more multilateral alliance that can actually counter Chinese expansionism, not ASEAN. 
Their second and final response is that these democratic countries in, in the Asia Pacific region will also will always turn to the United States because the US is also democratic. Well, they've given you the example of Malaysia, which is right now turning more authoritarian and, and modeling after China, which proves that Chinese influence will be able to change the shift the regional system that the US has built for decades. But second and most importantly, countries always want to prioritize their national security. Even if the US is democratic, they don't want to challenge China because China will be able to exert more influence, invade their sovereignty and such. And that's why right now they're shifting towards China. And the only way of stopping that is by Japan providing security to them so they don't need to do this. At that point, the weighing here is very critical. Their case is all about Japan doing foreign interventions, but ours is so much more important. First, obviously on a magnitude scale, this is a great power conflict between China and the United States that could escalate to a nuclear war that's so much bigger. But more importantly, when Japan and these East Asian countries are so focused on like wars in their own region, they don't have time to do interventions in other countries, which completely takes out their case. But secondly, remember that uh, right now, the U.S. reputation has been almost like the U.S. has done tons of interventions in all these countries. They cite Iraq and Afghanistan, but we've still had strong alliances after that, which means that Japan won't destroy their alliances, which takes out their wing. At that point, let's move over to our opponent's arguments. There's a bunch of big problems here. First, remember that they agree that Japan pretty much has the same foreign policy as the United States. What does this mean? Well, whichever country like you, the U.S. actually intervenes in, in the Middle East, Japan would do the same. Maybe they'd contribute some. But the important thing is that this civil war won't be prolonged or last longer because whenever the U.S. leaves and whatever agreements the U.S. signs onto, Japan will do that as well. So the intervention won't drag on. Whatever, this is a completely non-unique because whatever interventions the U.S. does do, Japan will do the same. Japan's not going to start any new conflicts. It's completely non-unique here. The impacts have already happened. But also, remember, they just say that Japan relies on 90% of their oil from the Middle East. They probably want to keep that stable supply of oil. They're not going to want to start new conflicts. More importantly, by revising Article 9, Japan actually has the ability to be seen as a global superpower that can actually have diplomatic relations with these other countries in many conflicts before they start in the first place. At that point, it's very clear you're voting for the affirmative side. Thank you. All right, ready for Grand Cross? All right, can I first question? For sure. Okay. Uh, wait, let me just get my timer real quick. At the point where you concede that China perceives Asian as a military alliance, but you also concede the fact that Asian already is being strengthened by countries such as South Korea and Australia, doesn't that mean that per your internal link, Asian is strong enough to oh. counter Chinese hegemony and stop a great power war? I, I, I didn't say the first thing. Maybe I misspoke or you misheard, but let I mean, me, you did in rebuttal when frontlining. No, 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 no. We said the exact opposite. In rebuttal, we said that ASEAN is not a military alliance, as per your own response. Exactly. Both sides have agreed that ASEAN is not military. It can't counter China's military. Yeah, but you so frontlined my military. response. How I have it flowed is that you frontlined my response by saying that China perceives yes, it as a military no, alliance. No, even I, if I, it is. Frontlined, I Wait. frontlined your response by saying that China does not perceive it as a military alliance. And because of that, it no takes out your turn. Because of that, no Japanese militarization will change that perception because China fundamentally believes that ASEAN is, is not, not military. there for military purposes. In flow That's speak, we conceded the defense to take out your turn. No, but, yeah, I know that, but like I got another additional problem. But whatever, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, the question. All right, cool. Um, yeah, let's go back to your impact of foreign interventions, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So your impact evidence, right, about how foreign interventions reduces the quality of life and can prolong conflict, right? Is that every single new country that intervenes or the intervention in the civil war itself as a whole? Specifically, which piece of evidence are you talking about? I mean, the you extended the 4 million stuff. Right, so our 4 million evidence says that foreign interventions into Iraq and Afghanistan have killed 4 million. And that was like a one country actor. That yeah. foreign intervention was the US. So like if the Japan intervenes- as It was the US coalition. Yeah, and US there was like 30 different-, 30 different Yeah, there was 30 different-, yeah, 30 different, different Our evidence specifically outlines the US and the UK as the primary actors behind this, which is yeah. really crucial and leads me to my next question, which is that if, the, if Japan is mirroring exactly the- U.S.'s foreign policy, like you say, and then you also concede that U.S. foreign policy has directly slaughtered four million people in the Middle East. How is that anything that's like beneficial? How so, is that like a mitigation? When I say they're mirroring foreign policy, I mean they're going to intervene in the same conflicts and they're going to leave the same conflicts when the U.S. does. I didn't say Japan's not going to send the same amount of military force as the United States when they don't have the productive capacity to do so. And secondly, you don't read any evidence that, you, that Japan is literally going to send the same amount of troops as the United States. 
what they will do is probably contribute some amount of forces to the US, which doesn't make that big of a difference. Because again, the war has already started. The US, the biggest player in the region, has already intervened. Like the impact's already happening. So they already, have, they already have the same incentive as the United States to intervene. They have the same goal, but the mechanism by which they achieve that goal is drastically yeah. different. The United well, States is a hard hitter who uses massive power, whereas our argument is that Japan would contribute, but not the same magnitude, which is why you don't access your impact. That's not you say they follow exactly what the U.S. does. They have the same goals, so they yeah. achieve them by different methods. Okay. We're going to take, wait, it was 147 plus 11. So that's like a minute left. Yeah, about. I'll just take, I'll take a minute. All right, time starts now. So the order is going to tackle the weighing to be at the top, then go to our case. Uh, so I'll, I'll make sure that I'll make sure to signpost, but yeah, it's going to start on the weighing debate. Is anyone not ready? Let's extend our short circuit weighing. If Japan intervenes abroad, allies feel that Japan is focusing on continents across the world rather than their own alliances. That's because Japan is seen as interventionist. It decreases their credibility and makes their allies feel ignored. That directly short circuits their entire link. That means no allies will ever come to Japan's defense and counter China if they think Japan is focused on the Middle East rather than their own region. They tell you that the U.S. had a strong alliance or like had strong intervention across the world, but still had alliances. But the U.S. is allied with the Middle East. Japan is not. Japan is viewed as going into another country that they're not aligned with rather than their allies in East Asia. Let's go to their weighing. They give you two pieces of weighing. First is on magnitude. They say nuclear is much bigger. But I'd say that the biggest risk of a power war is actually proxy conflicts from probability for two reasons. One, in intervention, there's no direct mutually assured destruction. But then second, economic harms are minimal as war is not on the direct soil of countries. Always prefer probability over magnitude because like dropping a water bottle could cause a nuclear war by a low probability, but I wouldn't pull my trigger on that. You're always going to have this policy paralysis. Then they say that wars and that, that like if there's a war in their own region, then they can't intervene in other countries. But our evidence, our impact has time frame over theirs because intervention always happens immediately. But a great power war has a really long time frame. Let's go to our case and why you're pulling the trigger on that way. Despite past attempts to intervene in foreign conflicts like the Gulf War, Japan's Article 9 has bared them for doing so. And that would decrease uh, the, uh, Japan. After revision, Japan would intervene because of war hawks. The Japanese government is ridden with right-wing nationalists who have popular support and are eager for conflict. And Japanese intervention is detrimental as their energy dependence means intervention would likely manifest in the Middle East, causing civil conflict as uniquely killed 4 million people in the Middle East. All they say is that like there are other actors who are gonna do this. One, it's scalar. Two, that Japan has unique, in, unique benefits in the Middle East, they're going to be intervening what helps Japan, not what helps these other countries. Then on their case, the reason why you literally can't vote for them is because no democracy is ever going to turn towards China. They only cite Malaysia, which one is a theocracy. This isn't a new development. And then two, they only cite one country. We tell you that most countries really hate Article 9. They're not going to become aligned with Japan. All right, we have 10 seconds of preparation left, which we'll use now.
Okay. All right. Is anyone not ready? The order of this speech is going to be talking about the world. Nothing fancy, very simple. Anyone not ready? My time begins now. Foreign policy is a cake with two ingredients, intent and capability. Remember, even if Japan has the same intent as the United States to intervene in foreign conflicts, they do not have the same capability, which is why my opponent's response utterly does not apply. Our argument is that Japan, like the United States, intervenes into conflicts where they have absolutely no business being there. They have no relationship with the government. They're essentially just intervening to further their own influence and their interests of the military industrial complex. This means that since the United States is the biggest hitter in the game with the most skin in the game in terms of wars in the Middle East, Japan might contribute, but they won't contribute to a degree that is significant enough to trigger their impact about 4 million people dying. This analysis was not responded to in my opponent's speech, and it pretty much ends the round. But what's more specific is that their way says that if they win this argument, then it short circuits my case. No, it doesn't. The United States also intervenes into other countries where they have no business being there. Libya, Iraq, Syria. We do all of these interventions, but still have alliances in places like the Middle East, which proves that intervening into the Middle East does not destroy alliance systems, which means that the only path to the ballot is on our case. And it's very, very simple. Right now, the green evidence, which has been conceded, explains that Japan, that, that the United United States power in the region is waning. That means that the only way to stop Chinese expansionism and the only way to stop a great power war from happening would be to revise Article 9 and allow Japan to project the creation of a new alliance system. Their responses say that by weighing about 2 billion people dying doesn't apply because proxy wars are worse. Sure, proxy wars between the United States might and China might break out, but our argument is that those would go nuclear and kill 2 billion people, which outweighs their case on magnitude. Their only response left says that countries won't turn into the United States, they'll turn to China. But our evidence which they have conceded says that countries will turn to whichever is the military power in the region. Because China has been expanding for the green evidence, which they also concede, that means that countries are turning towards China right now. The only risk of stopping this is by signing your ballot for the pro. Thank you for your time and Mission San Jose VP affirms. Good round, y'all. Thank, good you, round, for y'all. thank yeah. you for a good round and thank you for judging. So I was the last uh, person to judge or submit my ballot, so I will start. So the decision was uh, for the F21. So um, I'll just go through, I was one of the one who voted for F apps. So let me explain you my thinking as why I did that. Uh, To me, the entire debate came to one singular point. And the point was, is the status quo in the region sufficient as what it is right now? And I know I understand what you were thinking, like next we're talking about in terms of foreign intervention and the impact and all those things. Uh, that was very valid point. And given the Japanese history of uh, World War II and other uh, in historically perspective, I can see that happening. But at this particular time, the way I was, uh, I looked into all the both sides of debate is basically revising article nine is the only way to check the power of China in the region. And um, I totally agree with the apps around the regional alliances in terms of Australia, China, I'm sorry, Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, coming together to um, take the power of growing military power of China. And China's power is not only growing in Asia, whether you talk about Malaysia, you talk about Philippines, or uh, talk about Africa, the economic power is coming from the military power. And that's why I sided with the apps uh, on this debate. All right, um, I guess I'll go next. Um, obviously I did of course uh, vote for the NEG, um, but I do wanna say that this was a really tight round for me. Um, AF, you've got some, uh, interesting rhetoric going on with your analogies that I found um, very engaging to listen to. Um, So especially at this point in a tournament of champions, there's no shame. It's not like you did something drastically wrong. Um, It was just for me, everything sort of went back and forth like clockwork to where it almost felt like everything washed itself out. 
what I ended up voting on um, is basically I, I bought that Japan would follow in the United States footsteps, but the problem is if Japan does that, they don't have the same standing or history. Um, and even only going in the same places as the U.S., um, the response to them isn't going to be the same because the U.S. has had the largest military by leaps of magnitude um, for decades. Uh, they have been interfering in places where they don't belong and aren't wanted for decades. Um, and basically, it's, you know, it's the globe's big brother that you can't, you know, whether you like them there or not, they're just going to do them and you have to find the best way to work with them. Um, Japan is going to be smaller. They don't have that kind of influence. Um, and so no matter how they follow in the United States footsteps, I just don't, um, you know, with, with their imperialist history, with the history of um, uh, war crimes, but without the oomph of the United States. Um, I think the fear of what they could become would be uh, too great. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's where I came down. But great round, guys. And congratulations. Hi. Um, well, I voted out. Um, yeah, so for me, this round, I mean, I think it was kind of straightforward. Um, I like this round. It was a good round. Um, even kind of from the beginning, this was, this was funny. The neg, you structured your C1 like the same way I structured NFU cases with my kids. And AF, you had a lot of similar uh, contention names as ones that I used in high school. So I just noticed that that was kind of funny from both sides. Uh, but in terms of the way the round came down, um, so our start on the weighing, the issue with the neg is you kind of switch up your warrant going from summary to final. Summary, it's like the imperialist, yeah, you see, in summary, it's like the imperialist perception stuff, and then in final, it's like, oh, foreign engagement, it means I can't, I don't know that your engagement is solely with me, you know, kind of like a, you're friends with them, so you might not be friends with me kind of thing, and that little switch up made it difficult for me to evaluate the prereq, and even more than that, I think the response is legitimate. Um, the U.S. has been doing this, Japan hasn't. The response to that isn't really flushed out, which is just like, oh, but Japan doesn't really do this. And it's like, well, I don't really know how much that grants you offense or the prereq on their case. Maybe it makes it more difficult for the Japanese alliances to come together. So I guess this is why I'm starting with that. That's the most legitimate thing that has influenced offense in this round. Coming off of that, all I know is the Aflink is maybe a little muddled. The issue is I don't think the Neg has much of a case after final. Um, I don't really know why Japanese engagement is scalar. It's just kind of asserted and it's not really explained. And the only impact I get is generally about interventions and like the two largest interventions in the Middle East. Um, it didn't influence the ballot, but I would just say like, you generally want to be careful because they, you know, there have been other interventions in the Middle East since then and they could have called y'all out. Um, so I don't really know the unique impact of them. You say Japan has unique incentives, but, um, the idea that Japan's engagement allies with the United States was in rebuttal, so I needed that response in summary. Um, Japan isn't allied. That's, like, new implications and final. The weighing, I think, was fine, like, that the proxy wars. Like, I think that was fine being new and final. Like, I don't know why people freak out about weighing. Well, they freak out because sometimes people read probability weighing, and they just, like, insert a response, you know, i.e., yeah. Um, but the weighing was fine. I think that if you're going to read probability over magnitude, you just want to read some kind of a warrant, right? I think that probably the best warrant to generally read prob over magnitude is just like shifting policy norms because the policy paralysis argument is like, okay, but it takes a bit of time to make, you know, so it's kind of difficult to bring it up in final. Um, I like the water bottle example, but I think how quickly you go through it, it takes judges like a second sometimes. And so you want to be careful with metaphors. Um, so, but I think generally though, the weighing was fine. The issue was, I, I don't think that, they're accessing case, right? So why don't I default neg? Well, AF uniqueness is conceded, right? So at this point, it's like, do I think AF wins any risk that they develop alliances? And yeah, I think they win some risk. I mean, the response is, one, it's only about Malaysia, which was already a theocracy, right? 
well, the response is kind of over time, but even if I'm buying the response, it's kind of new and it's just kind of asserted, you know, and I don't really know how true it is. I don't know what's up with Malaysia, but they give me this evidence that appears to be talking about Malaysia. And they also say it talks about all these other things and they describe a general trend in the region. Um, also, I'm not even sure, AF, I don't know why you spent time. I'm not sure you need to win this response in order to win your case. All you need to win is that China war is happening and that Japan can counter them. You can win that just winning a deterrence link. Um, but they, so I think that there's a risk that alliances form. Um, I think it's much clearer to me that there is a danger of not forming those alliances in the U.S. war because you, their uniqueness isn't contested. Then the risk that Japan engages because you're that, that Japanese engagement is bad because you, there is defense contesting your impact scenario. You know, so just because of where defense was emphasized, I think that kind of kicks off the wing and there's a clear way for me to vote out. If y'all have any questions about that, you can go right ahead. I'm fine with people. Yeah, I have, I have a quick question. So given that like you buy the probability warrants in final in like the problem was mostly just like our link story in case. And also given the fact that like, I, I like from what I'm understanding, like the problem wasn't that they had responses, but more like our actual link story to get your ballot, would we just need to like get the actual impact scenario like more structured? Yeah, well, I need I need some yeah I need some explanation as to what what Japan does, you know, like is Japan like all I get is that Japan goes and it's scalar. That that's all I understand. As a judge, that could be Japan sends two dudes over with binoculars to tell U.S. troops what's happening. You know, it could also mean Japan sends their whole military. You know, like. Those two extremes, there's enough variability that I just have no clue what your impact is, you know? So the, the weighing analysis is like this, this independent, I'm going to steal an AF argument, it's like a satellite kind of floating, you know what I mean? And y'all need to access it first, you know? But the weighing itself was fine. The weighing, I think, yeah, the weighing was good. All right. Got it. And Carson, do you have a question or? No, it was literally the same question. I was okay. going to ask, like, is, was our internal link the main, like, issue yeah, it's just what what's unique out of Japan. I, I don't know. Got it. Uh, I had a question uh, for Alec as well. So, can you explain why we didn't need to basically frontline the Malaysia defense in order to win the link on C three? Oh no, you needed it to win the link on the C three. I just thought, I don't know. It was interesting co going into your summary. Like you could have done this thing where you just kind of redevelop a deterrence link and then just say Japan can independently check. You know. Um, yeah, you also had the – y'all read that that U.S. turn, right? I'm not forgetting, right? Uh, not quite sure what you mean by that. Uh, on, on I, no, I, might, I, might be, I might be mixing rounds up real quick. Um, but no, I, I think that you can always recreate the turns links whenever you're winning China war scenarios, right, independent of regionalism. Because if Japan's an independent military, even if the alliances don't necessarily work, Japan still has an incentive to protect them because they want to form alliances. Right. Same reason the United States tries to protect Ukraine, even though Ukraine's not in NATO. Right. It's like even though formal alliances fail, if Japan develops a military that's capable of deterring China, that's an independent reason China is worried. I guess that might not be the right word. They might be more precautious about engaging violently with allies, with potential allies of Japan. You know, like there, there's an informality that extends deterrence. Um, yeah. So then you can just recreate a China deterrence link and or Japan deterrence link to China and kind of plug it in there. Um, yeah. But you were winning your link fine in this. All right, thank you. All right, uh, that's it for us then. Uh, thank you all for judging. Thank you for a great thank round. Thank you. Good luck, y'all. Thanks. Yeah, good, good luck, luck guys. Thanks, guys. Congratulations. Yeah.